So how do you do this live stream? This is something PIFR bought or? Yes. Uh, oh, I see. Your channel. I remember ACS did something like that, but they went live on Facebook. Let me see how this works. Let me check. Okay, out. fantastic. Okay, so we are live now. So I want to welcome all the audience that have joined in uh, from YouTube live link and the audience in the Zoom for this uh, special edition of the NSF Wednesday Colloquium. And we are absolutely pleased and honored that Professor Abhishek Day from um, IACS Kolkata has joined us for this uh, talk on CO2 uh, reduction, um, which she will, of course, enumerate in due course of time. But before I formally introduce Obishek, um, to many of whom you, uh, you know, many of whom you know him pretty well, but I would like to still formally introduce him. Um, I would like to tell a little bit of the, uh, about the history of the NSF Wednesday group for Obishek and other people who are joining in for the uh, I'm listening. First time, yeah. So uh, the NSF Wednesday Day Colloquium is as old as TIFR's history. Um, ever since the start of the institute, uh, our founding director, Professor Bhumi Bhava, um, instituted this idea of uh, getting all the faculty members from the natural sciences faculty, be it a physicist, physicist chemist, or biologist, to get together once a while in, on a week, on a Wednesday, 4 p.m., and sort of listen to lectures from eminent experts from across the world. Of course, the idea was set in, in a space when physical meeting was common and people used to visit TIFR. So it was also a very nice play, uh, way to ensure people visit TIFR, the TIFR labs, and listen, and all of us listen together to an eminent expert. Um, because the, the entire talk would be in form of a broad um, scientific talk. So today it's no different. Uh, of course, we are going to listen to an eminent expert in catalysis, uh, Professor Obhishek Day. Um, and I would like to first uh, sort of uh, formally introduce him. Uh, Obhishek actually uh, did his bachelor's from um, uh, Presidency College, uh, University of Calcutta. Uh, he finished his bachelor's in 1999. Then he went to IIT Kanpur to pursue his master's in chemistry, where he spent two years there. And after doing fantastic work in master's itself, um, he actually sort of had a, almost a paper publication from his master's. Um, he went to, uh, he went for his PhD uh, in Stanford University, where he worked with an eminent expert in physical inorganic chemistry, Professor Ed Solomon. Um, after doing uh, a, a brief postdoc with uh, J.P. Coleman in um, Stanford, he actually came back to India in 2009, if I am not wrong, Abhishek, um, where he started his own independent lab in ISES um, Kolkata. And uh, he sort of, uh, uh, sort of flourished for the last uh, 12 years uh, he has done some exciting work from his lab that has been recognized world over. Um, and, um, you know, uh, and especially work using, um, in the idea of using organometallic catalysts um, to do different kinds of small molecule activation and, you know, especially oxidation and reduction reactions. Uh, for his wonderful work, Obhishek has not only, been, uh, not only won national awards, but international awards. And especially I would like to mention that uh, he actually was a recipient of the ACS Division of Inorganic Chemistry Young Invest Investigator Award, um, Society of Porphyrin and Thalassanian Young Investigator Award, as well as the Society of Biological Inorganic Chemistry, which is one of the biggest societies in bioorganic chemistry. He won the Emerging Investigator Award. Um, of course, uh, nationally, he has been recognized by the CRSI bronze medal. And recently, he also was uh, very special, uh, received a very special funding from SERB as SERB Star Fellow. 
Um, apart from the awards, uh, he has been associated with advisory boards of various important journals, uh, chemical reviews, chemical communications, inorganic chemistry, uh, journal of Bi biological inorganic chemistry and ECS catalysis. Uh, and in fact, he's an associate editor in ECS catalysis. So without further ado, um, Obishek, uh, the floor is all yours and we are all ears to listen to your uh, work on CO2 reduction. So Obishek. Well, thank you, Jerry. It's always a uh, pleasure uh, coming back and talking to TFR. I uh, love, love this institute since I was a graduate student. We came there for a conference, me and from the time, 2005. Shaman Aura had organized the most wonderful Asian Bioinorganic Chemistry Conference. Uh, so uh, after that, I've maintained my relationship with you uh, and all my friends in TIR class. I'm happy and honored to be included in this list of colloquia that you uh, host, and you have been doing so for so many years now. Uh, let me try to <coughs> share the screen. Uh, just a disclaimer, there's a chance my laptop is going to crash uh, while I do the Zoom because it's been doing that for a while. In case it does that, uh, I'm, I'm logged on uh, with my alter ego from another laptop and he's going to take over. Okay. Uh, you can do a full screen. Yes, thank you. This good? Yes, perfect. Okay. So, uh, Welcome to the show. Now, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, CO2 reduction work that we do in the uh, group. Now, before we talk about the scientific details, let me sort of set up the context of CO2 reduction as we have learned to see in the group. And of course, a group is only as good as its students and I have been really fortunate to have some really great students walk to my lab. And what I'm going to talk about is essentially a culmination of all of their hard work and realizations in terms of our understanding. We work in different areas. Uh, essentially, we are uh, inorganic mechanisms group. So our focus is not really catalysis. Uh, our focus is really understanding how chemical reactions happen. And there are a couple of reactions which are interesting to us. But the unifying form or unifying factor in all of these are these are reactions that require multiple electrons and multiple protons. Uh, now, that requires substantial investment in understanding proton transfer as well as electron transfer in this reaction. Uh, particularly, there are a couple of reactions that you already know are very popular and often uh, described as holy grails of in our chemistry, for example, hydroxylation of alkenes by molecular oxygen, uh, reduction of oxygen to water. Now, the one that we're going to talk about is CO2 reduction. Now, CO2 reduction is important for environment. And we'll uh, speak a little bit more about that. Uh, essentially, if you, if you look at the reactions that we are dealing with, some of these are important for energy, for example, hydrogen, reduction of oxygen. Uh, you can use them as uh, fuel cells or chemical storage of energy. Similarly, <clears throat> generation of liquid fuel, these are all very important for energy. For the environment, we are bothered with a lot of CO2, uh, SOx, NOx. So fixing them into some kind of a useful chemical form are important for environment. So at the end of the day, energy and environment are things we need to worry about if we are to have a sustainable life. Now that brings me to the most important question, which is, uh, what is life? Now, if you ask this question to anybody, uh, is life all about uh, symbiosis of chemical reactions in a single cellular organism that has evolved to give you beautiful uh, multicellular organisms like fish, human beings, that can somehow accidentally found its way all the way in this small blue planet rotating around, revolving around the sun? Or life about is about you know going to school, getting education like us, join a company or a factory and make a lot of money. So <clears throat> of course, the answer depends on who you ask. So different people will have different perspectives about life. Someone would say, eh, life to aisa hai, life to waisa hai. Somebody would say, life to paisa hai. Somebody like me would say, life to jaisa paisa hai. Now, <clears throat> but as a chemist, we have a very different point of view of life. 
at the end of the day chemically speaking life is nothing but the balance of energy generation and energy utilization we have all seen this from our textbooks from class 6 onwards photosynthesis is the process of capturing sunlight and generating glucose respiration is at the end of the day utilization of the glucose to generate energy now in all of this i would like to present to you the same phenomena in a different context see in photosynthesis you know water gets oxidized to oxygen co2 gets reduced to glucose and of course these are uncoupled they happen during light and dark phases but if you follow the flow of electrons essentially what you are doing is you are dragging electrons out of water and you are dumping them in something like co2 so the electron flows from water to co2 respiration is just opposite glucose is the source of electron so you get the electron that was stored in glucose and drag it out and put it back in oxygen to generate water right so food is nothing but a reducing agent so next time when you are hungry think of food as a pool of electrons don't order that in a restaurant that would be difficult to get and comprehend but that's what food is it's stored electrons that you can oxidize and get energy out of now this is more universal than aerobic life that we live in when you look at the in across the entire spectrum of organisms in the biosphere this is general where depending on what organism you are looking at if that belongs to a carbon cycle if that belongs to sulfur cycle if that belongs to nitrogen cycle different reduced forms are oxidized in their respiration to give you energy and the energy that you get of course depends on what is the oxidant so right at the beginning of evolution when the planet was young the oxidant that you had was co2 which did not have a very high reduction potential it got slightly better with the sulfur cycle when you got sulfur which is a stronger oxidant than co2 it got better yet with nitrogen cycle when you had nitrogen and eventually it culminated into generation of oxygen when uv light started penetrating the atmosphere and hitting water and that resulted in multicellular thinking cognitive organisms like us so this question that arises if you find where these all these reduced forms that we can oxidize and get energy out of come from how did they arise well you have to remember planet earth is pretty old like 400 billion years ago this exchange of energy between a reduced respiration from electrons flowing from a reduced form uh, compound to an oxidized compound is what has been driving the planet since the inception of life life itself 4 billion years ago so there's a charging process where these reduced species have been produced and there is a discharging process where the reduced species are oxidized to get energy and this is the global cycle of life which at the end of the day is nothing but a battery where over the last billions of years energy in the form of solar geothermal has been stored in the form of hydrocarbons reduced form of nitrogen sulfur and solar energy to generate oxygen this was the charging process of the planet but the discharging process which has become acute because of evolution life and high form of life being evolved it's really accelerated with the intervention of the species called homo sapiens which in its pursuit of all fiery ideas in our exuberance of uh, a young species on this planet we have been rapidly utilizing the energy this reducing equivalent stored under the soil to get energy and do whatever we want to do and resulting in release of oxidized forms of carbon nitrogen and sulfur in the atmosphere 
without realizing the fact that we came into the planet in an atmosphere where these elements were under the soil in their fixed form. When there was a lot of NO and methane and SO in the atmosphere, we did not exist. Carbon reducing bacteria, carbon methanogens existed. But now in our pursuit for excellence, we have woken up these beasts and now they're in the atmosphere. And now we have realized the extent of threat, this habitual generation of oxidized forms of carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur holds to organisms <coughs> because we cannot survive in such an environment. Now, today's lecture is mostly about the oxidized forms of carbon. Because what we really need to do when you just, if you want to reverse this, if you want to clean your atmosphere, if you want to make sure that we can breathe the air that we are creating, we need to fix it back. So we need to recharge the planet. And the way is just how the planet got recharged to begin with. Use the energy available, store it by fixing this gaseous oxide into some form of material which can be taken out of circulation. That's the whole idea, I think my lecture would be based on and today we'll be talking about carbon dioxide or oxidized form of carbon. Now the carbon form that we are mostly worried about, my son is in the audience, is carbon dioxide because it's tremendous potential for storing infrared energies so it can heat up the atmosphere. But as you know, there's another prominent villain in the play and that's methane. Hardly we realize uh, 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 sort of, I would say, I don't, I won't call it a global conspiracy, but this is definitely a factor that's hidden from us mostly, is the amount of emission that comes from meat industry and the amount of water it uses up. And in today's, by today's estimate, in a couple of years from now, the meat industry would produce more greenhouse gas when you factor in all the energy requirements and land requirements than all the human activities apart from that combined, which I think is a genuine threat. Now, we have to fix this from the carbon, particularly let's start with CO2, that's very popular, has been for a while. Let's start with fixing CO2. How would you want to fix CO2? What form of carbon do you want to generate from CO2 so that would solve your problem? For that, let me show you the current uh, landscape of carbon utilization in different industries. Now, generally, you can reduce CO2, you can comprehend reducing CO2 carbon monoxide, formic acid, methane, and alcohol. Carbon monoxide is a very valuable chemical. It is very easily fixed into hydrocarbons using fischer tropsch process and it is used up in chemical synthesis, make polyphenols for polymers. Now realize all of this generates solid fixed form of carbon. So if you make CO, use it to make polymers, that carbon is out of atmosphere, assuming you don't burn it or dump it in the ocean. Similarly, when you look at formic acid, formic acid has a massive inertia demand mainly because of tanning. If you can don't contaminate the water with it, but you can also make batteries, and I'll show you something about that. Similarly, alcohols, they are used to make formaldehyde, which is uh, essential for polythene synthesis, which is again fixed form of carbon. Right? Methane is a gas, you can compress it, liquefy it, but its most important use or prevalent use is that of a domestic fuel, but that does not really fix your carbon because you burn and generate. CO2. Now realize in all of this, all forms of carbon are derived from some kind of animal source, coal, oil, natural gas. So all of the carbon that you can generate from CO2 would eventually, if you can fix it in terms of material, would remove CO2 from circulation. Now, I'm very excited about the formic acid, simply because formic acid 
can be used in battery. Of course, it's going to generate CO2, and I'll tell you how to deal with that. And there's someone in the audience who has made a formic acid battery and has a company. He's a good friend of mine from Bob Wevaud Lab in Stanford. And Andy has demonstrated the use of formic acid in batteries, small toy cars. And Andy, if you're listening, I'm doing this so that you gift me your first formic acid car for free, along with that collection of Monte Carlo paints uh, dedicated to Leo Tolstoy. Uh, so that aside, so we really want, if you ask me, we want to reduce carbon dioxide either to carbon monoxide or formic acid if we want to fix it in some form of material that can be put to that can so that carbon can be taken out of circulation okay with that background i'd like to get into the scientific part of the lecture how do you go about now what we do in our group when we design a molecule which can reduce co2 we use an approach called electronic retrofitting some of you may have heard about this before so bear with me essentially what we do is just like organic retrosynthesis where you look at a molecule and you cleave bonds so that you can create it back and your synthons in electronic retrosynthesis for catalysts that can activate a small molecule, for example, CO2, the molecular orbitals, the frontier molecular orbitals are synthons. For example, if I want to reduce CO2, I want to put an electron density into this LUMO, which is mainly carbon based, and the LUMO plus one, which has CO5 star orbitals. And the source of electron has to be a metal. And the metal has to have in its orbitals that will overlap with this frontier molecular orbital of CO2. Orbitals that make logical sense are things like dz squared that can directly form a sigma bond or dxzyz that can form a pi bond. So if you, if you take this approach, you come up with a minimal criteria of reducing CO2 in terms of number of d electrons that you require and the spatial orientation of the d electron uh, that you need to fill in. So there are two scenarios which are common in inorganic chemistry geometry, a trigonal geometry and a tetragonal geometry. Trigonal geometry could be a PVP or a distorted tetrahedral type. With the goal of populating dz square and dxzyz, a trigonal metal center will require at least six electrons. So a D6 configuration with a trigonal geometry would be good to reduce CO2. If you go to tetragonal, you are going to need a D8 electronic configuration to because the DXY is going to be lower in energy. Now, this is the geometry of the compound, but once, let's say you have a trigonal geometry, right? With this three ligand. When CO2 comes from top, it's not going to be trigonal anymore. It's going to become a tetragonal type. So this tetragonal D8 square planar type geometry is ideal for CO2 reduction. Keeping that in mind and realizing the fact that reduction entails transfer of electron density from the metal to the bound CO2, you're going to generate a charge separated intermediate of sorts where there would be negative charge on the oxygen atom of CO2. So what you can do is think of stabilizing that negative charge by using hydrogen bonding, some electrostatic interaction, things like that. Obishek, there is a question. Yes. Obishek, ah. there is a question in YouTube uh, in real time. Uh, Abhinav Choudhury is asking how single atom catalysts can help in electrochemical carbon dioxide reduction. Yes, uh, Jadishman, is it okay to address because this is a generic question. Yeah, so you can address it later. Yes. Yeah, uh, but I'm going to take a mental note of it. Yes. Perfect, bit. perfect. I'm definitely going to answer your question. But if you follow the logic of catalyst design, the answer would slowly present or reveal it to yourself how the principles we are designing are also implementable in single atom catalytic catalysts. No. Can I ask a quick question on uh, this thing? Uh, yes, uh, the slide that you have. Yeah, so uh, quickly, so the redox potentials would matter. And in this case, are you looking at taking carbon dioxide from uh, carbon dioxide to formic acid? Uh, at this point, I am just looking at activating carbon dioxide for reduction. 
the fate of the reduction, as in how many electrons we put in, that's going to come in a little later on. Right now, uh, I'm talking about what kind of geometry around the metal center and what ligand uh, conformation and electron occupation you're going to need to activate CO2 for reduction. If you are going yes. to in two or four, that is going to come up as you will see how the mechanism works, which I will unravel as we go. Okay, so so the redox potentials are of course going to matter. So in that case, you would have to fine tune the geometry along with the redox potentials, right? Actually, uh, reduction potential for CO2 to CO, CO2 to formic acid and CO2 to methane, they are not that, uh, that's not a problem because the first two electrons, imagine CO2 to CO is the most energy demanding state. Everything else is downhill. So if you can get that, the others become easier. So if you look at the uh, cross diagram of CO2, so that is why I'm saying if you can get it to CO, then everything else, at least energetically, is downhill. But getting to CO is the challenge part or formic acid, the first two electrons. So we decided that we are going to first figure out how this reduction happens. And of course, please understand activation of CO2, reduction of CO2, this is not new. This problem has been researched by scientists for at least 40 years. 50 years, people have been looking into ways of capturing CO2 from atmosphere, reducing it to some kind of carbon. This is not new. This has been going on. So one of those people is late Professor Jean-Michel Savian. And he did some initial work on CO2 reduction and came up with the mechanism of how CO2 reduction happens for one of the very popular uh, set of complexes, which are iron porphyry. And that is what got us interested in this to begin with. So what Professor Savian came up with this CV simulation, simulation of a cyclic voltammetry data from electrocatalysis, is essentially you have to reduce the iron porphyrin, which are generally iron two, iron three, you will hear about iron four to an iron zero state, which can bind CO2. Now, if you do the math in your head, iron zero is dH, and the porphyrin is square planar. So this is exactly what you would expect based on uh, analysis of the ligand field and the frontier molecular algorithm of CO2. Of course, then he went ahead and, and he uh, proposed a few intermediates that thought was going to occur when you reduce them under electrochemical conditions. Of course, this mechanism comes from simulation of a cyclic voltammetry data, which is greater. But one of the things he never did, or their group never does, is actually following the reaction chemically and seeing what species are formed as the reaction progresses. Now, that is something we are pretty good at. And that's something we have been doing for a while. And in my discussions with Professor Savian, that's something he always told we should do, that look into the intermediate, because cyclic voltammetry does not tell you what the chemical species. It tells you that this can happen. So we took up that job sometime in 2015, and we found that obviously this is something a lot of people have thought of, particularly iron zero porphyrin was new to us, because I come from oxygen uh, activation background, where I have heard of iron three, iron four, in some cases, even uh, compound one, formerly iron five, but never I came across iron zero in porphyrin. But of course, literature is vast. People like Bob Scheidt have been looking into low valent iron porphyrin for a long time. They even have a crystal structure for iron zero porphyrin back in 1980s. Okay, there's a crystal structure of iron zero. It's D8, so you can see nice square planar geometry. These are sodium from sodium anthracite that was used to reduce this. My client did a lot of Raman spectroscopy on this and figured out how to characterize that and figured out problem associated with uh, stabilizing this iron zero species. So with that background, we get into this area. We started by reducing iron porphyrin, iron three, as we prepared them. And we add reducing equivalence and we get to iron zero porphyrin. We know it's iron zero because we can titrate it back with three equivalent of oxidant to get the iron three. Now, when you take this iron zero porphyrin, you add some CO2, immediately your spectroscopy tells you it gets oxidized. Now, what do you uh, use for spectroscopy? Porphyrins are really amenable to absorption spectroscopy in the UV visible range. 
as well as resonance Raman spectroscopy. Now, let's not go into the details of resonance Raman spectroscopy, but let me just tell you, in resonance Raman spectroscopy, the symmetric porphyrin ring shows uh, several vibrations, which are mostly ligand-based, but they're very sensitive to the spin state and the oscillation state of the central iron. This was established by Kitagawa back in 1980s, and then Spiro and a lot of people. And this is, has been a really fantastic high fidelity marker without any failure till date in identifying what is the spin state and oscillation state of the central iron in a porphyrin ring. For example, if you, if you look at these two marker bands, I'll be talking about mu4, mu2. For iron 3, it's 1362, 1555. For iron 2, it's 1343, 1542. For iron 0, this is something we figured out, 1325, 1542. And these are very different. You cannot miss them. And here are the actual spectra. Your, your iron 3 is red. Your iron 2 is green. Your iron uh, 0 is blue, right? So you, we take this. We have a way to now look at the porphyrin. What is the oxidation state? Now we look at what happens to the Raman. When you add CO2 and you give it a proton source like uh, paratonin sulfonic acid because CO2 reduction requires proton. So, oh, we your new two, your new four is split. New four is split by uh, uh, iron zero. Yes, Gary. The okay. symmetry of the porphyrin is gone because of a deformation. Okay. Okay. Uh, and and that's why it's split. Okay. Uh, the iron three is not split. This is intentionally we have kept a mixture of iron two iron. Yes, yes, yes. The population two different populations. Yeah, just to show that you can figure out this even mixture. Okay, now we take this iron zero porphyrin, we add our CO2 and acid, and your black spectrum becomes red. So immediately you realize your iron in the porphyrin ring got oxidized. Great. Now, if you look at the low frequency region, you pick up a nice iron carbon spec at 524. This is typical of iron 2 CO iron carbon vibration. So, okay, great. So you have formed an iron 2 CO, and you can also see the carbon stretch. Now, we did this reaction in, in our pursuit to see if we can see intermediate species. This reaction was carried out at minus 95 degrees Celsius. And the reaction went like bullet. We could not see anything within a second. It was so far. So we realized the reaction of iron zero porphyrin with CO2 and triplic acid is super fast, gives you iron to CO rapidly. So, but we, we didn't learn anything. So what do you do? You do the obvious thing. What can you do? Right? You say, okay, fine. I'm using triplic acid as a source of proton. It's a pretty strong acid. Let's lower the acidity a little bit. So we go to phenol because that was being used by Savayan and his collaborators uh, for uh, proton source, right? When we add phenol, before the reaction goes to completion, we identify an intermediate at minus 80, which is dark red in color, and that was great. So we saw one intermediate. And we look at the Raman spectroscopy of the intermediate, black, iron zero, red, your iron two CO, your intermediate is in gray. Okay, now gray has this 1363, 1555, which is great, but if you're a spectroscopist, you would notice as Jody was, Jody was saying, there are shoulder peaks. That means there is another species prior to the formation of minus 80 that we missed. Okay, so what can we do? It is fine. Let's get rid of the phenol. Let's use methanol. And in methanol, at minus 95, we see another intermediate, and that's green in color. So now we see two, the green intermediate at minus 95, the red at minus 80, before this becomes the iron carbonate product. So we look at these intermediates, and yes, intermediate one is a new species in purple, intermediate two is a species in gray, final product in red, and of course you start from black. Now what are these species? Well, if you're doing vibration or spectroscopy, apart from just looking at the oxidation state and spin state markers, you can also look at metal ligand state. Remember the iron carbonate APC that we can see in Raman. So what we do is we look into the iron carbon region of, of this. And what we do is we use label carbon dioxide, 13 CO2. The reason for that is simply this. In vibration or spectroscopy, your frequency goes inverse of your uh, reduced mass and reduced mass depends on the mass of the molecule. So if you isotopically level your 12 carbonyl with the 13 carbonyl, your mass increases. So any vibration that involves 
the carbon is going to shift to lower frequency. With that, we can see an isotope sensitive band at 590, which is iron carbon, and at 810, which we think, uh, think it's a CO2 bending mode inside the porphyrin cavity. Let's not go there, but we see an iron carbon set. Now, the intermediate two, uh, which is at minus 80, even if you let the methyl solution go to minus 80, it comes to intermediate two, does not have the 590 stretch. Instead, it has a stretch at 521. It has another stretch at 1188, which vanishes if you replace methanol OH with OD, deuterium substitution, suggesting it's a CO, COH. So you replace the H with B, it got, it's gone. To low frequency, we don't see that. With all of this combined, we do the IR and we can pick up the CO stretch of the intermediate as well. So we have the entire vibrational spectrum of this intermediate too. And we bring all of that together. Now we have a mechanism. Iron zero porphyrin binds to CO2, generates an iron to CO2 to minus species. This is where two electrons are being transferred from iron to CO2, okay? This species is super basic. In, it picks up a methanol. It has a lifetime of a couple of seconds and minus 98. It quickly goes to this iron to CO species. Now this guy is characterized by this guy, iron carbon 521, C double bond O, 15, uh, it was 1557, and C single bond OH at 1188. So we have the entire vibrational spectrum of this intermediate. And when we do the experiment with phenol at minus 98, we go straight to intermediate two with this 528 and 1188 peak. So your reaction at minus 90 goes like this. You add phenol, it goes poop. Intermediate two, no intermediate one because this is super basic. You won't take a proton and get you here. With that information, and of course, with the stronger acid goes to us. This is the summary of what we have learned so far. When you're trying to reduce CO2, you have to consider issues for selectivity, which is what we are trying to get to. What our mechanism shows is you go through this particular intermediate iron. Uh, forming uh, iron COH. In this intermediate, this carbon has a high pK and can be protonated to release formic acid. This oxygen has a low pK and makes it something like a triplic acid or phenol to be protonated and release CO. So now we know, based on the intermediate that we track, how to selectively convert CO2 to either carbon monoxide or formic acid. And that is by deciding where we want to, to put the proton. Okay. The other issue in CO2 reduction is, of course, something that I'm not going to cover broadly in this right now, which is a competition with hydrogen evolution. Because your iron zero is very basic. And if it can bind CO2, it will bind the proton because proton is more acidic. If it binds the proton, it will either give you hydrogen or some hydride, which can give you formic acid, never CO. Okay, so there's an issue over there, and I'll come to that in a little bit. But the most important thing is the way to distinguish if you're going to make CO or formic acid is by deciding where to protonate in this very crucial intermediate, which we successfully trapped and characterized. So, based on this, we said, okay, let's come up with a rational design. We were dealing with iron zero porphyrin. Iron zero porphyrin. Is difficult to get. It requires very strong reducing agent because of a very strong reducing potential. Now, okay. Can I can I ask a question before you move ahead here? Yeah. Um, uh, Obishek, when you are trapping these uh, Raman uh, intermediates, like intermediates using Raman at low temperature, do you do you uh, get uh, population distribution of intermediates? Can you get population or everything is resonance Raman enhanced of one major population? No, 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 no. I mean, these are basically, they are all absorbing around the same frequency. Really. But you see this, this is, see this. You see how we get mixtures. Ah, mixtures. So you have mixtures. Okay. Right. So, uh, but the good thing is they show different carbon isotope shifts. So you can pick them up using a combination of both these vibrations as well as Intermediate two is easy to get. The intermediate one works pretty. Okay, okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so based on what we have learned with the iron uh, porphyry, we thought, okay, we need BH. Why do we need iron zero? How about we use cobalt one? 
Cobalt one is formally less reduced, easier to access. So, and it's of a D8. So we came up with a design with a cobalt one compound, which had dithiolate. The idea of putting in the thiolate is partly inspired from a natural enzyme that reduces CO, CO2, CODH, but also from the fact that we are going to need electron density to reduce the CO2. So there's a FMO argument to that as well. So we came up with this cobalt compound, which has dithiolates and uh, uh, should help CO2 reduction. And this is what happens, we get very good CO2 reduction data. In particular, there is almost no over potential in CO2 reduction. I'll come to that uh, in a bit. So what happens is, if you're new to electrochemistry and all that, uh, you measure the cyclic voltammetry in the presence of, in just the compound, and then in the presence of your substrates, uh, that is CO2 and water, and you look at what happens to the current. If there's catalysis, the current keeps on going up with the increasing uh, substrate concentration, that's how you know electrocatalysis is happening. So this is what happens when, when you do the cyclic voltammetry and you keep on in, uh, increasing either CO2, over here the current keeps on increasing, or water, the current keeps on increasing, you see a lot of uh, current, so you know electrocatalysis is happening. So you're con constantly consuming current from the electrode, and that's why the current goes up. And uh, this is a wonderful catalyst. It has barely 50 millivolt over potential under these conditions. It's a huge rate, large turnover number. And also remember here, the proton source is water. Now, let me take you back uh, to artificial photosynthesis. Water, CO2, giving glucose. This is water, CO2, giving CO. So this is a partial artificial photosynthesis in many ways. Of course, not photosynthesis, there is no photo Yeah. Okay. So this is a this catalysis happen in a flow or in a batch reactor? Sorry, I cannot hear you. Uh, is this a flow reaction or a batch reaction? Uh, this is a batch reaction. Batch reaction, okay. And do, do you have some sort of a conversion number, like how much percentage of CO2 you converted into the CO? Yeah, you will see that. Okay. So what you see is across this entire potential range, you get only CO. And the phyletic efficiency, I think this is what you were asking, right? Yes, Abhishek, yes, yes. Yeah, so it's greater than 95%. We see only tiny amounts of hydrogen. So for example, this is the amount of CO2 that we collect, and this is the amount of hydrogen that we collect. And you can see the scales are off by orders of magnitude. Okay, so this is really clean CO2 to CO and nothing else, not even formic acid across the entire potential range. Now, of course, we are interested in mechanism. So we thought, okay, what the hell is going on? Now, we do in situ spectral electrochemistry. And what we see is just like the iron case, where we saw a iron COOH intermediate, we see a cobalt COOH intermediate, which is characterized by a CO double bond vibration carbonyl at 1684 that goes to 1643. And we compute this intermediate and the shift matches pretty well with the experimental data. Now, there are a couple of things that one has to realize are important in this. First, when we add uh, carbonic acid, that is H2 and CO2, the thiolate gets protonated first, not the cobalt center, okay? Uh, when you reduce the cobalt to cobalt one. And we know this from a shift in the cobalt two, cobalt one cyclic voltammetry by 280 millivolts when there is carbonic acid. And under these circumstances, uh, this ends up lowering what is known as the over potential for the process, this 380 millivolts. Also realize because the proton is going to the ligand, the metal is not getting protonated. Because the metal is not getting protonated, you're not going to get hydrogen, as we see. And you're not going to get formic because of uh, CO2 reduction, because formic goes generally uh, by metal hydride reducing CO2. You're not going to get formic either. So this is a very important part in the design uh, that we have come up with. Use a ligand for the proton delivery. So that eliminates hydrogen, that eliminates format unless you don't want it to. And I'll show you examples. Now, once you make this cobalt three COH intermediate, 
The cobalt three is a very strong Lewis acid center. You know that. What it does is it drains the carbon center of all the electron density. Okay, and you can see that in the frontier molecular orbital. This is like the dz square sucking all the electron density out of the carbon, such that the carbon has no negative charge. This is the carbon center. All the negative charge is now in the oxygen. So, where can the proton go? On the oxygen, and that is exactly what happens, leaving you with CO. If the carbon center had a lot of electron density, the proton could have gone to carbon, giving you orbital. And I'll show you an example later. Okay, so we use the principle that we learned from our mechanistic uh, studies with iron porphyrins to devise an easy to make, simple but very selective cobalt thiolate based catalyst with remarkable catalytic activities. Now, before I go to the next part of the lecture, let me give an outlook of what I've been saying, you, telling you this part. You take a metal, which we, from our retrosynthesis, we know. The first thing you have to deal with is competition between proton binding and CO2 binding. And we figured out the best way to do that is use ligand to suck up the proton. So it eliminates the metal hydride. Once you do that, you get yourself to this particular intermediate. Now, once you get to the intermediate, you have a choice of either protonating the carbon or protonating the oxygen. I showed you an example where by tuning the covalency of this metal carbon bond, we selectively protonated the oxygen, giving you CO. But this actually raises the question, can you do the opposite? Can you actually tune the proton delivery such that you are going to bind the carbon and not the oxygen? Now, we have been playing with my proton shuttling system for oxygen reduction for 10 years now. And so if you just go to the fridge in our lab, not to undermine the people who made this, you will find like tons of these molecules where we have been planning for proton delivery shuttle to oxygen intermediates involved in oxygen reduction. And these are very beautiful molecules made by the students I was talking about, where you know you find these guanidine groups with different PKAs, pyridine, amines, aromatic amines, bipenantrolines, phenol, phenol, all of them. We have them. So we are in a very good position to test these hypotheses with very targeted proton delivery systems where we can not only control the PKA of the proton donor, but also the stereochemical orientation. And I'll, I'm going to tell you a success story of that. So these are the crystal structures of the molecule that uh, I showed you. You'll see in all of this, the proton donors up here, up here, up there, up there, they're pretty far from the metal center. So no matter what we do, if we want to protonate this carbon center, it's getting difficult because the proton donors are far from the metal center. And this has tremendous role in oxygen reduction and that's a different lecture altogether. But in CO2, that's a problem because it will always end up protonating the oxygen and giving you CO. So we have to come up with, or rather, my student SK Amanullah had to come up with a design of a ball frame where the proton will be very close to the iron and this is the molecule we synthesize. Generally, Amma never synthesizes easy porphyrins. We call them difficult to find because of the steps and the uh, difficulty involved in synthesis. He makes it sound easy, but not easy, right? If you look at this, this looks like total synthesis of some organic compound, but then we are habituated to them. Now he established this porphyrin ligand framework where by these order reaction on this activated pyrrole, he could install a nitrogen, tendon nitrogen, pretty close to the iron center, which was evident from the crystal structure of a nickel analog that's pretty close. Everything else was up here previously, all the compounds. This one is pretty close. And he confirmed this orientation in solution with a series of brilliant NMR spectroscopy data in solution. So with that, he started looking into CO2 reduction. And how did Amanullah actually separate the two possible reservoirs of the Diels holder on the two pyroles? So there are two pyroles. 
in the electrochemical conditions because we are applying a potential to reach iron one. So despite like the iron three intermediate form would go to iron one or iron two. And he does that and he gets this iron two series that he gets solid and he can do the IR. And lo and behold, this gives you a peak at 1682, which is the same thing that you see under spectroelectrochemistry. And because he got solid, we can do MOS bar. And when we do MOS bar of this, MOS bar tells you about the, uh, the isomer shift and the possible splitting tells you about the metal center. And the first intermediate intermediate is one isolated from the reaction of iron one and CO2 is this guy with an isotope uh, a shift of 0.31 and delta Q uh, quadruple splitting of 0.68. The iron carbon, the CO stretch is 17.24. The iron carbon is 5.68. I think something got messed up over here. I'm sorry. This is the iron carbon. This is the C double bond O. This is the iron Mosbach data. If you reduce it by one electron, you get the intermediate two, which is formed during electrocatalysis. And this is with different Mosbach isotope shifts and quadruple splitting and a different IR. You bring all of this together and you can construct. The mechanism of CO2 reduction by this iron chlorine analog under both chemical and electrochemical conditions. And I know there's a lot of data in the previous slides. So I'm going to spend some time on this slide. Uh, Jerry, how much time do I have? You still have at least 10 minutes. Don't worry. You don't know how much I have left. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, 10 minutes is enough. Thank you. So, Essentially, what's happening is you take this iron chlorine, reduce it, get it to iron one state. Now, this iron one state is active enough to reduce CO2. Now, this is a big improvement because previously you had to go to iron zero, which means more energy needed to reduce to get to the catalytic form. Here, not so much. This iron one reacts with CO2 and water from the medium gets you this intermediate that we can chemically synthesize to back up our arguments, characterize with bunch of data. Under chemical conditions, this can hydrolyze and give you 98% formic acid that we trap using ion chromatography, NMR, with level carbon dioxide and all that. Under electrochemical conditions, because you're applying a potential of minus 1.48 volt against uh, ferrocene ferrocenium, to get to the active form, this potential is constantly applied. This guy gets reduced to this guy that you see accumulate under electrochemical turnover conditions. Because Amman can make both of these in solid form, he can also do a cyclic voltammetry of this iron 3 species, which he did. And this iron 3, iron 2 has a potential of minus 0.64 against ferrocene. So obviously, this reduction will happen under electrochemical conditions where you are applying this potential. And this is what we see accumulate under electrocatalytic conditions, which hydrolyzes to give you formic acid. And why it accumulates? Because this is the red determining step of your reaction. And that is why this accumulates under catalytic steady state condition. Now, a key factor in all of this why this is only 50 millivolt? No iron compound can give you CO2 reduction at 50 millivolt. Impossible. It all is like several hundreds of millivolts more negative molecular compound. But this works because this works in iron one state. The reason it works in iron one state is because the CO2 only binds iron one when this is protonated. If this, if you don't use carbonic acid, there is no catalyst. If you don't give water, there is no catalyst. It's just regular iron 3 2, two 1 CV. Only with CO2 and this carbonic acid plus water CO2, you this CO2 bind. And that is because it, this carbonic acid, uh, sorry, this intermediate is stabilized by direct hydrogen bonding. Forgive me, I didn't show it here. Direct hydrogen bonding to this pendant domain. And that is what drives the normally uphill. CO2 binding to iron one bottle. This hydrogen bonding stabilization of the bound adduct. If you remember, we laid it out 
as one of the criteria of catalyst design right at the beginning. So we can make CO, we can make formic acid. Now, can we go further? Can we take it down further? Now, this is remember, I'm a mechanistic anomaly that to me, to doing a reaction that's perceived as impossible is the biggest challenge. Can we see we, we can make CO with barely any over potential, 98% selectivity, huge TOA and TOF, no issue. We can make formic acid, huge TOA and TOF, no issue, very selective. Now, can we make methane? Not because we need methane, but can we do this? Okay. And the reason, uh, the uh, thing you have to realize is what happens is once you make this kind of CO adapt, when you are reducing CO2, this CO, it, once uh, it is formed by dissociation of water from this iron 2 CO in the medium, gets reduced to iron 1 CO, and it has very weak iron CO bonding, so the CO escapes. The CO escapes the moment you reduce iron 2 to iron 1 perfect. If we can somehow find a way of trapping this iron 1 CO, maybe we can take this intermediate further to further reduction. Now, I'm going to come back later. Is transfer a proton before the CO goes off. You have iron 2 CO, okay? That uh, once you reduce, make it iron 1, iron 1 CO, CO goes off. That's how you get CO. But before the CO go, go on, if you can use this pendant protonation sites that we were talking about to quickly protonate the CO before it goes off, you have a chance of reducing this powder. And that is exactly what Somishta in my lab is working with. What she has been doing is using this pyridine containing iron porphyrin to trap the iron 1 CO before it dissociates with the proton sound protonation so that it becomes iron HCO, a hydroformine adapt of iron. And we don't know the details yet. This is work in progress. But what she can find is by tuning the PKA of the external acid, she can generate substantial amount of methane from CO2 reduction. Okay. And this is the final touch of this lecture. So this is where we stand in CO2 reduction. My son, that is my picture of my son who is looking at some river in North Bengal. And it's actually like collecting pebbles, right? We, we start from here, we understand how this mechanism works. We get to a point where we understand how to control the selectivity between hydrogen formation and CO2, metal hydride formation and CO2 adapt. We figure out a cool way of doing that is using a pendant ligand to pick up the proton and then activate the CO2. And this got us to places where we can generate tons of CO2, uh, our selectivity concerns by protonating this oxygen, liberating CO, gets us tons of CO. And now we are trapping this iron one CO and one day maybe we make methane. But what I want to leave you with is a concern that I have with this CO2 area is how do you go forward from here if you want to really address the CO2 issue? So the problem is you have to catch CO2 and then you have to fix CO2. Fixing CO2 now has many ways. All the catalysts we are designing, they're very good. Materials, single atom, so on, saying, you can fix CO2 to CO formic acid that you can use. Yes, there's work to be done in terms of selectivity, separation, because you know, if you think like an industry, nobody likes a mixture of product. Every industry wants one clean product. And that is why selectivity is the key. CO2 to CO, if you can do selectively, CO is pure, easy. CO2 to the formic acid, you do it selectively with nothing else, no hydrogen, no CO, they will love it, great. But where do you get the CO2 from? I am getting it from a cylinder. But a cylinder of CO2 in Kolkata is 26,000 rupees. And the reason for that is CO2 is very difficult to separate. And this is nothing new. Again, 30 years back, you will find issues on Camry dedicated to CO2 capture by Napa Motor, by Daniel Dubois, 1970s, 1980s. Okay. The problem is CO2 capture is inefficient. And again, Andy is here, he's blocking. If you look at the economics, people believe it won't never work. Direct. CO2 capture. Okay. And I recommend reading up literature 
I'm not the right guy, but that's my perception. Now, one way of dealing with this, you catch CO2 where it's emanated from, flue gas, the big chimneys, which have this ominous villainous role in our society now. Even I like a two year kid sees this chimney and learns to hate it because that's the biggest problem in the planet. But without that energy, the guy cannot even turn on the computer and look at the chimney. I read it. But the fact is, you need to catch where this is generated, and that's your flue gas. Flue gas can have anything between 8 to 15 percent CO2. So the problem with flue gas is it has oxygen, it has water, it has some SOX, it has some NOx. Anybody working with CO2 would be lying if they tell you that their catalyst will work if there is oxygen, as efficiently as it works without oxygen. If there is SOX, if there is NOx, this is very rare. So if you want to tackle the problem of CO2 by trapping it in CO in flue gas without excess separation, you need to come up with inorganic systems or materials that can reduce CO2 in the presence of oxygen, in the presence of SOX and NOx. And that's what we try to do right now. For example, this what I skipped before, we have systems that can reduce CO2, dissolve CO2 in 100% oxygen network, they are very selectively, no issue. Recently, my student Oishik, they came up with a system, I don't post in this because that's what we think is working in all of this, that can reduce sulfur dioxide to sulfur monoxide, which can be trapped in organic. That's our sulfur fixation. Similarly, Amman has shown how we can reduce NOx like nitrite NO to generate N2 and ammonia, things like that. So this is something you need to remember going forward. Okay. Now, with that, thank you, Jerry, for the invite. Great others to be in this platform. And I thank my students in the group, past and current, who has uh, added to this knowledge. These are my new students. Shovik Jinda was missing in action. Sorry, Shovik, I'll put you later in that picture. And of course, everything I do, I can do because of my wife, who really lets me be who I am. Difficult most of the time, but only she can put up with me. And thank you all for your attention. And if you have questions, let's discuss. Thank you, Abhishek. And I would request all the audience to unmute and give a big round of applause to Abhishek. There's something very nice. This is here. Uh, Vivek, yeah. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, in the in uh, in a very real colloquium, when you visit here, you know we take you for tea after this. Unfortunately, <laughs> I don't have anything, any such facility at this point. But Abhishek, thank you very much. Um, so, and I would li like to request the audience members to now unmute themselves and ask questions directly to Abhishek. By the way, Andy is here. Andy has joined in. Uh, Andy Wong. So, yeah, Andy wants to ask a question. Yes, Andy. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> and Abhishek, this, as always, this very interesting talk. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't have camera set up for my laptop, for my desktop, but I, I, I actually uh, do not have a question, but more like a comment about about your 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 last slide about carbon capture. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, carbon capture, of course, is very energy uh, intensive. Uh, when we talk about carbon capture, uh, it, it it can be under, understood as a process for separation, right? You, if you're talking about uh, direct air capture, that is to concentrating. A, a feed stream with uh, 400 ppm of CO2 and into two, two streams uh, of say 200 ppm CO2 and one pure CO2, right? So the, the minimum energy can be calculated by the difference of the work potential in, the, in these uh, thermodynamic states. And a lot of people have already done this calculation. It is about 20 kilojoule per mole of CO2. But of course, in practice, uh, no one can achieve this ideal state. Um, and, and based on experience, most of the separation processes in industry can only reach 5 to 40% of the uh, thermodynamic limit. And considering the low concentration of CO2, of course, the, the case of direct air capture should sit on the, on the lower end. And that means about 10 to 20 times of the minimum energy 
we calculate would be needed to for the separation. And this is when when you when you scale up this to uh, the largest scale that we need to consider for mitigation of uh, climate change. I think the value is unrealistic because it's greater than uh, than the than our total global available energy. And talking about and 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 your your beautiful chemistry talking about storing energy in CO2, say in the form of formic acid, for example. Uh, and, and, and you are right, because in the end of energy utilization, we are going to regenerate CO2. So in this case, CO2 only serves as a carrier. So we, we actually don't need a lot of CO2. We just need enough CO2 to store the energy for, for our application. And I would say maybe 20 gigaton. And then we have a mechanism to recycle this too. Then we don't need to worry about the rare air capture. Because, uh, because if we want to, the, in my opinion, I can be wrong. I'm sorry to take so long time. Uh, in my opinion, the, 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 the direct air capture and even bioenergy coupled with the carbon capture and storage, BCCS, are, are market because, I think because the oil companies want to, want to continue their business as usual. So they, they populate the idea of emit today and then capture tomorrow concept. But the, the problem is once we emit CO2, we can never capture them back. That's right. And, and, and we need to realize that, and, and actually uh, now uh, carbon capture from the, from the point of production, like a power, power stations, has been deployed. And then the, the, the scale is actually quite sizable, but, but those companies, very, very simple. For those companies, they need, they need to have a, a economical drive. So, so as you can expect, most of the CO2 captured is not just stored, it's actually used for EOR, enhance all your recovery. Right, I mean, Andy, I mean, that's why I think uh, well, you know, I talked about the formic acid battery, and yes. I think anything you do, as long as you can recycle the CO two that comes right. out. Right. So, 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 having said that, having said that, I, I think what, what maybe, of course, I, I can be wrong. This is under debate. I think what we need to do is just try our best to decarbonize our power generation. So we should, we should not even have. Uh, firepower stations in, in the future. And then, and then we just need to manage to use enough amount, recycle enough amount of CO2 so that we can, we can carry uh, low carbon energy, uh, given it solar, wind, or nuclear, and then recycle this amount of CO2. And when we have the, cap when we build up capacity so that we have surplus of low carbon energy, then we can consider how to reduce the CO2 concentration from the atmosphere or, or even convert them into some use, useful chemical. But of course, you already know, CO2 utilization, the global capacity is actually very low. We are talking about 400 to 800 million ton per year. That is not even 2% of CO2 we emit. So even if we can do it perfectly to, to convert all the CO2 to the materials we need, we we can own, we you know, I mean, at the best make I mean, in, insignificant com impact. Yeah, right? that's, also, that's, that's my comment. Sorry, no, no, sorry, so long. I, I that's okay. That's it. okay. That's okay. Yeah, I Obishek, your it. video is off. Obishek, your video is off. Yeah, I'm putting it up. I'm just making myself a quick cup of coffee as we speak. The <laughs> issue is, I think, uh, there are a couple of issues here. One is CO to capture from the CO two that we have lost. That's out of question simply because the amount of energy, and I think that math is pretty clear, although there are a lot of people that are hopeful. I think CO2 capture from the CO2 that we're emitting is a possibility, but then you're right, the best thing is not to emit. But that kind of transition of power structure, energy cycle, even with the best intent, is going to take decades. For example, consider India. We are 85% thermal, or even more, depending on the state that you're in. So shift from that is going to actually take a long time, even if we decide to do it right now, this day. So in the meantime, accessing that CO2 is a possibility. But again, I, I, I cannot hide this enough. 
CO2 from meat industry is going to become a huge issue and methane. That's going to become a huge issue. And we know this is sort of a problem built on another. The more the temperature rise, the methane from the permafrost comes out. So we have issues over there. But I, I agree with you in that, that the prospect of direct CO2 capture looks bleak when you do the math. But then again, if you cannot stop CO2, maybe try to recycle it by trapping it at the point of generation. Yes, yes, yes. And, and of course, uh, another challenge is that uh, we are talking about huge amount of CO2, right? Yeah. So after we capture, capture the CO2, there's no way we can use them. And therefore, there will not be any, uh, say, uh, economic financial return. So it, it will be also very difficult to, to implement the system because there's no uh, like financial driving force. So that is also something to, to be considered. Right, right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you thank for you, joining thank in. Thank you for discussing this. Uh, very nice. Uh, this is a nice discussion. Uh, I'll have Vivek. Vivek, uh, you raised your hands. Vivek. Yes. Hi, Hi Abhishek. Uh, very exciting talk as always. Um, and and uh, last point, uh, seem, uh, you touched on the very uh, challenging point where how do I you know, capture and convert the CO2 in presence of other impurities, which generally try to uh, you know, deactivate the catalyst, whether it's organometallics or nano. And you, you mentioned that you was able to uh, develop a, a organometallic complex, which allows you to do the CO2 conversion, uh, even in presence of SOX. So can, can you explain more? Because I thought the SOX is even more reactive and they should, they should deactivate all the ligands or the active site that we have. So what you did to really protect your active site from SOX? See, Vivek, uh, the reason why I like iron porphyry is because if you look at all the sulfate reducing bacteria, they use iron porphyrin to reduce SO2. SO2. They use iron porphyrin to reduce NO2, nitrate. So the advantage of using well-designed iron porphyrin is you can reduce all of them in one shot. So imagine your flue gas comes out with SOX, NOX, COX, and oxygen. If you can design a chamber with this kind of compound, if this ever becomes practical, you're going to be left with H2S, ammonia, and uh, carbon monoxide or formic acid. So it can reduce all of this in one shot. And that's where I always uh, like the concept of a universal catalyst. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, so, so what? I, I have this tagline. I don't know if it's visible. I, I put it mildly simply because it's challenging. One catalyst to fix them all. Mm -hmm. So, so Abhishek, what you are proposing is rather than separating these before the reaction, you first react them and then separate again, right? But like, for example, if you have ammonia and formic acid, uh, they will form some sort of a, there will be some reaction, right? In between them. And... That again, so what you're suggesting is like, don't separate before you have the, uh, the air with all these impurities and then react them uh, with your catalyst and have um, uh, ammonia, S2S, uh, formic acid. Right, and then again, you have to separate at, at one point of the time. You have to separate them. Uh, that is actually slightly easier when you consider the fact that uh, H2S is a gas, CO is a gas, ammonia would become ammonium in solution. So, there are advantages of doing it first, and practically, you're also going to get heat from the flue gas that can help catalyze it. Uh, this is just really uh, thinking out loud, but. The bigger challenge for us was actually dealing with oxygen. And what we could do is because, you know, oxygen, the issue with oxygen was it never gets reduced to water. It produces H2O2 and superoxide, and that degrades your catalyst. But we got very good at selective reduction of oxygen with more than 98% yield in uh, formation of water. And that's why we could use these porphyrins that could reduce oxygen to water to reduce CO2 and SO2 as well without getting hurt in the process. And I believe this is the only example we published this in HS catalyst last year. I think. This is the only example of a CO2 catalyst 
that works in uh, a lot of oxygen without getting degraded. And that I think, I think right now the focus for me at least is to figure out how to do this and then worry about how to practically uh, implement them. Now, of course, this is not, a, I, I'm not going to say this is a, a escapist statement. To me, this is a very plain and simple practical statement that I can only speak about the next step after having achieved the first step. And yeah. that's where we stand. And we are happy with the fact that we can generate uh, CO2 unabated in the presence of oxygen. And let me show you something. Uh, no, that's the advantage of a TIFL lecture. I have a lot of flexibility in <laughs> this stuff. So this is sort of, this is not the actual published manuscript, but a preprint of it. Uh, if, you, if you see this relay, this plot over here, this is percentage CO2 and the rest is oxygen and the Faraday yield of CO. And you can see even with 75% oxygen, we get a Faraday yield of only CO43%. And this runs forever. And the reason for that is a very simple inorganic chemistry fact. And that is, this is the rate of CO2 reacting with iron zero porphyrin. This is the rate of oxygen reacting with iron zero porphyrin. And I think there's a spin state barrier involved here. Iron zero is D8 square pyramid of its diamagnetic. Go and uh, work very well with CO2. But with oxygen, it doesn't tend to react. And I think we are being able to use this to our advantage in other cases as well. So there are certain advantages of starting with porphyrin because that's what nature has been using to fix SO2 and NO2 for billions of years. So that's what we are trying to learn from and emulate in our labs. Yes, thank you, Abhishek. Very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ankona, you, you had your... Yeah. yeah, I had a question, but uh, Abhishek has stopped his slide share. So uh, that catalytic cycle that you had, Abhishek, slide 45, I think. Putting it up for you. Uh, yeah, let me see. You mean this one? Yes, yes. So here you, you are doing this reaction at a pH where the uh, amine is protonated, right? And uh, when you show the the catalytic cycle, the amine is not protonated and yeah. you mentioned that there's a hydrogen bond. So my question is, is the proton being transferred from the amine uh, or is it just, you know, as you have drawn CO2 plus H plus and then there is some sort of a hydrogen bonding or is it participating in a hydrogen bonding or is it actually transferring to uh, make this uh, COH? So uh, the question you ask is very relevant. Uh, what you're asking is, it, is it a proton transfer or proton translocation? Uh, at this point, we think it's a proton transfer. So the reason for that is without that proton, CO2 doesn't bind. So we know that this protonation has to precede CO2 binding. So unless this is sort of the scheme over here, unless this is protonated, CO2 doesn't even bind the iron one center. Once this is protonated CO2 binds, there is proton transfer. Okay. Now, given how fast CO2 binds and the rates being very fast and everything, I'm not sure this translocates proton very well, Ankona, because I don't know if it plays any role in the hydrolysis of the COH intermediate. I have no evidence either way. So I'm, okay. I'm, I'm avoiding speculation and keeping the area open because we are going to pursue this in our future attempts, but I'm not sure it is uh, translocating proton very well. It's doing a proton transfer. It might be translocating, but I have no evidence. That to be done. And whilst you mentioned that you were isolating the intermediates, of course, at low temperature, but these reactions 
would happen uh, quite well at room temperature, right? In water. These are, these are room temperature. These intermediate okay. are all okay. room temperature. We could isolate them because at room temperature, uh, these are not very reactive, which is why we could get So this was quite stable. It would give you formic acid eventually, but it takes time. So we could get it. And then uh, in room temperature, you have the option of controlling how much water you're adding. So you could starve this of the required proton and go through the intermediate slowly. And this is not a very reactive species under these conditions where water is. Uh, but once you, for example, uh, if you look at the water dependence of catalysis, for example, over here, if you don't have water, there's nothing. But as you add water, mm -hmm. it goes up. And if you look at this, you need quite a bit of water for the reaction to progress. So that gives you the advantage of being able to control how much water you add under chemical condition and trap these intermediates out, which is what you could do. Okay, thank you. Very nice talk. And a big congratulations to Ammar because we know how difficult these molecules are to make. Really thank amazing you. work. Thanks. Thank you. Ammar is very happy. <laughs> okay, any further questions for Obishay? Any other questions from the audience um, at this point? If not, uh, Obishek, uh, this was fascinating. And um, I, I, I would uh, welcome you here again at some point of time so that uh, you can come back to the seaside and we can have a stroll and, um, and also discuss some more science. So, uh, so thank you, Abhishek, for doing this from your uh, office. And um, I wish uh, many, many more complex porphyrin synthesis and many, many more fantastic catalysts to come out from the lab and so much of detailed uh, sort of uh, spectroscopy of all these intermediates. Um, and and this, is, this is fantastic work. And I think uh, your, your work clearly demonstrates that uh, small molecule catalysts can still do the magic, which is so much under control of the synthetic tool that you have. So, so, so and, and you know exactly what you're doing at the active site. So, so, so thank you. Thank you, Vijay. So I will stop the, I, I actually wanted to thank also the um, uh, Mr. Ji and the members in the uh, lecture theater for keeping this talk on for people to join in and sit in, in the main lecture theater, even though everything is online. Uh, so he still projected it. Thank you, Mr. Ji. And uh, I also would like to tell the audience who are um, here that um, the next week we will be he hearing about uh, uh, the muon experiment we recently got data from um, in CERN. So from Amol Dighe, who will be talking to us about uh, all the new excitement around uh, the discovery. So formula, uh, formula from the formula, yes, from the formula. Sorry. So, uh, so Amol is here actually. Thank you, Amol, for <laughs> for joining in. So, um, with that, I would like to conclude the session. Stop the live streaming. So, I say a bye bye to the YouTube audience. There were no more questions, as far as I understand, from the YouTube.